Congratulations, by the way. You Thank you. Thank, Thank you. It's been been a whirlwind. All right. Exactly. So we have attendees are populating our room here. Okay. All right. Very good. So. Okay. Uh, welcome to CrimCon 2020. My name is Jim McCafferty. I am a Associate Professor of Criminal Justice at Kennesaw State University. I'm also a board member for CrimCon. Uh, we have here the 4 p.m. panel, Race, Policing, and History. This is on stream number four on Friday. This is the last session for stream four uh, for CrimCon. So it's very exciting. We have four great uh, uh, presentations for you. I'm going to go in the order that's listed in the program. If you are an attendee and you have any questions for our panelists, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, a, an icon that says Q&A. Simply click on that icon, type your questions. I'll be monitoring them during the, during the panel. And if we have time at the end for questions, I hope we get time to uh, interact with our panelists a little bit more. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Kadir and Hassan up to give your presentation. And when you're ready to uh, to go, I'll start your clock. Thank you very much. I'm going to just share my uh, screen. Can everybody can see that? Yes. Yep. OK, I'm just going to. Uh, all right. Uh, so hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, presentation. My name is Hassan Arslan. And, and my name is uh, Kadir Akius, Professor Akius. I am from the University of Bridgeport. And I'm from Western Connecticut State University. We will be talking about the politicization of the police, but we will be focusing on the Turkish uh, National Police. Uh, you know, the politics is who gets what, when, and how. It's all about the uh, allocation of the resources and the decision-making ability. And when we look at the American uh, just criminal justice system, we see that, especially when it comes to law enforcement, uh, sheriffs are being elected, uh, local leaders, generally choose their own police commissioners as well as you know, police chiefs. So you see actually some kind of uh, level of involvement in the American you know, police system. In fact, in the history from the 19th century to the 20th century, you see that how politics or the ideology is being in, you know, implemented in the American police you know, system. And I wanna you know, underline this word here because you will hear from my colleague uh, you know, how Turkish police is like really representing the arms of the Turkish government. The police is the mirror image of the state power. That's the you know, bottom line of our presentation today. And of course, everyone remembers, you know, the current administration firing, you know, uh, Jim Comey uh, as a political decision making. Okay, so the, this is the part that I'm going to introduce you a couple of things about the Turkish, you know, government structure. Is Turkey a constitutional government? Well, uh, if you, you know, you remember Turkey is a constitutional, it has actually a constitutional, you know, uh, but the problem with the uh, it's a little bit different. You know, Abraham Lincoln said in the Gettysburg speech is, this is the government of the people, by the people, for the people, right? So this is not the same fact in the Turkish government structure. So I want you to understand, uh, in, in the normal ideal world, this, the individual, the citizen stands at the center and everything is for the citizen, right? Or the, for the people. But in Turkish government structure, unfortunately, that's not the same case. The state is at the center and everyone dies, does things for the state. Okay, so this is the citizens of the state, by the state, for the state, okay? Uh, and of course, uh, if you look at the history from 1908 to 2016, I mean, this is clearly showing that how the Turkish history is full of interruptions. Uh, the government is being interrupted by military. Military is another topic, but as you can see, this is you know, the country where you can see several interruptions. Now, I'm going to introduce a couple of things because Kadir, you know, my colleague is going to talk about more. Uh, there are four stages and four actors in a Turkish military coup. It's a little bit different than the coups in the Latin America. You have the producer, you have the, the director is managing the coup, and then you have the actors taking their parts and the spectators, the partisans are just cheering for the coup. There are four stages in the Turkish. There is the idea of the coup forming up. There is the, the chaotic incidents, bombings, things are happening all over the place. And then there's the intervention where the military comes as a savior. And then boom, you have the final stage, the elimination. That's where you see the big, you know, perch. So I'm gonna you know, introduce my colleague here. Please, Kadir, take it over. 
Thank you, Professor Aslan. First of all, I uh, forgot to say that I have a law enforcement background with the Turkish National Police. So I worked for the Turkish National Police for more than 18 years. So uh, I'm, go I'm gonna also include my uh, experience during my, uh, with my Turkish National Police uh, during my presentation. Uh, for analytical purposes, uh, can, you, can you please next please, uh, Professor Aslan, next slide. For analytical purposes, we divided the historical development of Turkish National Police into four eras, historical eras, namely the Ottoman era, uh, early Republican era, uh, post-military coups era, and professional era. Uh, first of all, it was uh, the Turkish National Police was founded in 1845 uh, by the Ottomans in Istanbul, which is the largest city of Turkey. Uh, uh, but uh, because of the time constraint, I'm not gonna get into that era, the Ottoman era. I'm gonna start with the Republican era because now the Turkish National Police is the governmental organization of the current you know, Turkish Republic. The Turkish Republic was founded in uh, 1923 by Atatürk uh, and the, for the founding fathers of Turkey, the major concern was uh, as a new uh, regime, as a new Republic was to protect the uh, Republic and its foundations. So for that reason, to this end, uh, police uh, as well as the Turkish army was given uh, too much authority. They were able to arrest the people, arrest the individuals without any warrant, uh, and they were able to you know, uh, keep them in detention for more than one month. So there was too much uh, authority to protect the current you know, republic, the new republic. And the same approach was adopted by the second president of Turkey, who was dubbed uh, the national chief of Turkey, uh, Ismet Inönü. Uh, he also took some authoritarian measures to protect the republic. Uh, during his presidency, uh, many people from different political ideologies were rounded up by police, and they included the people like, you know, uh, sometimes they were ultra-nationalist people, sometimes they were communists, sometimes they were religious people, but the main purpose, the ultimate purpose was just to protect the new republic. Uh, in 1946, uh, uh, Turkey became a multi-party, a multi-party uh, multi uh, parliament, par uh, parliament system. Uh, parliament, sorry, uh, parliamentary system, and in 1950, uh, uh, at least nominally, nominally for the first uh, democratically held uh, election was, uh, I mean, took place, and uh, Democrat Party became, uh, they came into power, but after 10 years, uh, they were overthrown by a junta within the Turkish army, uh, and uh, even though this was the first uh, military coup during the Republican era, it was not the last. It was a very significant uh, turning point uh, for many aspects of life in Turkey, including the governmental organizations such as police. So of course, again, this time the same role, uh, I mean, protecting the current regime was given to Turkish police by this time by a military junta. This time they were to protect the new military regime. So as a result, next please, uh, Professor Aslan, thank you. So as a result, this resulted in more brutal uh, police practices. Just, you know, as an anecdote, uh, the other day I was watching a movie on Netflix. Uh, it was a comedy movie uh, titled Airplane, which was released in 1980, uh, the same year with the military uh, coup in Turkey. And there the pilot was asking the curious boy uh, in the cockpit, whether he had ever been in, or he had ever seen a Turkish prison. So even uh, the Hollywood movies actually emphasized the brutal uh, police practices at the time in Turkey. Of course, this, this was all the impact of the heavy political influence. It was a never ending uh, ordeal for the Turkish national police uh, from the beginning uh, of uh, uh, the, the police organization up until today. Uh, next, please. So there was a highly uh, deep political division between the members of the police organization, especially between 1970s and 1980s. It was so obvious for everyone that the British ambassador uh, in uh, Ankara, he sent a letter to, uh, in 1979, he sent a letter to British foreign ministry 
to let them know about the current political situation in Turkey. And then he he just, you know, uh, talked about this, you know, uh, polarization among the members of the Turkish National Police. And he stated that even during the funeral of a police chief, uh, the police chief was uh, a leftist uh, police chief uh, in, in 1975 and in 1978, two police unions were created. One was leftist and the other was rightist. Uh, Paul Dare was leftist, which means police union. Uh, and it represented the leftist people. And Paul Beer was uh, a rightist uh, union, police union. It represented the rightist, you know, police officers. So even during the funeral of a police chief who had a left wing political ideology, the members of the Paul Dare, uh, the leftist, you know, union, they chanted uh, political slogans against, against the rightist police officers or right wing, you know, uh, people. So there Sorry was a bit of you have, um, you have two minutes to go. Yeah, I'm just, uh, next please. So after three years, three years after the coup, 1980 coup, uh, Turgut Özal uh, became the prime minister of Turkey and he made a lot of reforms to make the country a more democratic country. But of course here, the main motivation, one of the motivations for political reform was European Union perspective, the membership, I mean, European Union membership. Uh, so for the first time, uh, the professionalization of police forces became a priority for the Turkish uh, uh, governments because the European Union wanted the Turkish governments to improve the human rights, basic human rights, and to express their constant commitment to human rights. So as a result, uh, after that period, many harmonization uh, legislations were passed by the Turkish governments under the Copenhagen criteria. And we can say that it was only after 1980s that I'm not saying that there was no professional professionalism before 1980s, but it was more militaristic in nature, the Turkish police forces. But after 1980s, it was for the first time that the Turkish police forces became more civilian and professional police uh, forces. Uh, and actually, I believe that they just gained a, a good rep international, good international reputation during that period. Uh, and they, they achieved a lot. And these reforms, they continued with the uh, AKP, uh, I would say, regime, the current President Erdogan, who I would call a dictator. Uh, I mean, in the beginning, with the motivation of the European Union membership, uh, he also did a lot of reforms, uh, I mean, towards the human rights. I mean, he did really, I mean, significant reforms. He made really significant uh, reforms, but later, as he gained more political power and as he wanted to increase his political power and also maybe some material you know, benefits uh, for his uh, own, for himself or for his family, things began to change. And next please. And in 2016, uh, after uh, a false flag uh, operation, coup operation, uh, which you know, we believe uh, was a false flag uh, coup operation, which was organized by the, the, the current regime in Turkey. I mean, thousands of police officers, they were dismissed from their jobs. I mean, they were experienced police officers. Uh, the police academies, uh, the, uh, the military colleges, they were all shut down. So uh, in short, uh, the, the never ending political influence uh, on the Turkish national police actually still continues today under the current regime in Turkey. Okay, that's it. That's pretty much that's pretty much it. Thank okay. you for thank you yeah, for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. I went okay, to graduate guys. school with uh, several Turkish national policemen, and this was uh, uh, very enlightening. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so I'd like to invite uh, uh, Leandro and Louise up to give their presentation. Okay, here we go. Hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, Perfect. we can. First, uh, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity and to congratulate the whole Green Com team for this wonderful event. We and other colleagues from our study group have been participating since Wednesday and it's been great. So long live to this, to this project. Um, I was the academic supervisor of the work that will be presented here. Luis Felipe is the true author of this research. The reason why, without further ado, I'll give him the floor. It's your turn, mate. Hey. Hi, my name is Luis Felipe. I am military policy officer in Brazil. 
and I'm currently doing my master's in law and society. This study was developed as a requirement to obtain my bachelor in law degree. The purpose of the study was to analyze the chance in the shock trip admission training in action after the 2013 public demonstration, also known as the Brazilian Spring. The research was conducted using literature review and document analysis. In the 2013 public demonstration, hundreds of thousands of people gathered in the streets, protesting against various things as public transportation for corruption, police violence, etc. We witnessed a new form of manifestation different from all others that had happened in Brazil. This new movement was particularly marked by the lack of leadership, the horizontal organization, and the predominance of young people use the internet to organize all actions. The movement reached its peak on June when more than 1 million people took the streets simultaneously in 75 cities. Our democracy established in 1988 with the proclamation of the new constitution had no experience in, in dealing with conflicts promoted by huge social demonstration. Additionally, some state military police force then were poorly trained. During the 2013 demonstration, there was the predation of public institutions, buildings as a form to manifest the non-recognition of representativity or legitimacy of those who were governing the country. In Brasilia, the capital, the National Congress market was occupied and the Itamaraty policy depredated. The government in reaction to enforce law and order was to call the military police and more specifically, the shock troop. The shock troop is a special unit of the military police and it's designed to operate in distinct and peculiar activities that transcend the operational capacity of regular preventive and repressive policy. These units are employed in policing of huge sport events, especially of prison houses, urban and rural state repositions control of civil wrongs, and also a supplement for ordinary policy. The shock trap differs from other conventional units. It is equipment specific missions to it is assigned. Therefore, its training is important in the process. It's important to understand the conflictive point of the action of shock trap, which is grounded on the maintenance of fundamental rights freedom of expression, for instance, and the stating clap down of crimes committed by demonstrators. Understand this action, both the rightful ones and also the technical flaw allows a fair assessment of these police operations. Beyond the Hickory technical qualification, the shock troop is formed by men and women with characteristics and training distinct from ordinary policing. Nevertheless, the proper technical capacitation of the state shock troop members was implemented only on the first semester 2014. With the establishment of a specialization course on riot operations, this was the remedy found by the state to enforce the technical response of the military police actions new and modern equipment for personal and collective use was also purchased after the Brazilian spring, like ballistic helmets and shields, and also armored vehicle, equipped with water cannon, reinforced bumpers for clearing, block the roads, and monitor cameras. If in the years before the Brazilian spring, the police were not properly qualified for this situation and there were many conflicts involving police agents and protesters. Our study proved there were important changes in the structure and training of police officer after this experience. We believe an equipped police, proper training and specialized committees to democracy and constitutional standard of protection of citizens 
is essential to describe future of the modern society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. I appreciate that. So, um, I believe we're on to our third panel then, which is, and I've just lost my thing here. Uh, who will be presenting from that third group here? Is it Chloe? Yes, I will be. Okay, all right, Chloe, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you guys for all taking some time out of your Friday afternoon um, to come to one of the last presentations at CrimCon. Um, so I'm Chloe Wensoff. I'm a second year PhD student here at Bowling Green State University. My colleagues on this project are Philip Stinson and Steve Brewer. Um, we're going to be presenting on police crime against Black victims. So before I get into our study, I wanted to give some theoretical framework and some background on um, our project. So critical race theorists essentially state that race, racism, and structures of power um, are ingrained in every aspect of the criminal justice system. And this starts at police encounters and the discretionary decisions of those police encounters and goes all the way through the processes of the criminal justice system, um, leading to prosecuting decisions as well as sentencing decisions. Um, individual racism as well as institutional racism is prevalent here. Um, Terry versus Ohio laid the foundation um, in support of this racially biased policing and it kind of got the discussion started. Um, they stated that blacks are almost three times more likely than whites to be pulled over by the police for a traffic stop. Um, during this conversation, there was a term coined um, blackophobia, which described black individuals as criminals, which explains why police officers were fearful of them. Um, continuing on with this conversation, police legitimacy and kind of the procedural justice, um, it kind of explains the relationship between police officers and the community in which they're policing. So does this community feel like they're treated fairly, um, as well as are they accepting of the judgments of the police officers and other actors of the criminal justice system? So in 2000, it was stated that many Black people are distrustful of the police. This is very prevalent still today. Um, police militarization is prevalent with the violent side of policing. Um, this starts in police academies where many police academies are seen to be pretty comparable to military basic training, where they're taught this warrior mentality and they're taught to prepare for battle essentially. Um, so getting into our presentation a little bit or our study, um, the Police Integrity Research Group at Bowling Green um, has a larger research project that this is just a smaller part of. Um, so the Police Integrity Research Group studies sworn law enforcement officers who have been arrested. We identify our cases through Google News Search Engine by the use of Google Alerts, and our inclusion criteria states that the individual must be a sworn non-federal law enforcement officer at the time of the arrest or at the commission of the crime. Additionally, they have to be arrested after 2005. And the big one that I kind of want to highlight here is they do have to be formally arrested or criminally charged. So if there's just simply allegations against an officer or reports of their misconduct, they don't necessarily fall into our data set. It is only once they are formally criminally processed through the criminal justice system in which they um, meet our inclusion criteria. So our unit of analysis here is criminal arrest case. Um, this allows for a singular officer to have multiple victims or multiple dates of arrest. Um, so a singular officer can have multiple arrest cases. Uh, our study focuses on a decade of police crime from 2005 to 2014. And a limitation of our study is the missing data associated with victim race, um, which is, has reduced our sample size. So our sample size is 865 criminal arrest cases. Um, there are two limitations there. The first is these cases have to have a victim identified. Um, for example, a lot of DUI cases don't have victims. Um, so one, there has to be a victim identified and two, we have to know that victim's race. Um, so some of the descriptives um, that I kind of threw on this slide here, essentially are just the basic things that we capture for every criminal arrest case. Um, the officers vary by age, rank, years of service, race, sex, um, agencies, that vary by region, types of agency, and then victims also vary by relationship to officer, age, race, sex. 
Um, this is pretty standard um, compared to our larger research project, but something that I do want to note here is that 38.7% of the cases that we identify in our sample are victims um, that we've identified as Black. Um, additionally, not on this slide, I do want to highlight our five different types of crime, which are violence related, alcohol related, drug related, sex related, and profit motivated. Any of these cases can fall into none or all or any combination in between um, of these different types of crime. So this is something that I'll touch on later in this presentation. So for our preliminary um, results here, we looked at the bivariate associations for victim race. So in order to do this, we have a dichotomous variable, black versus non-black, and we ran some correlations against um, some of our variables here. So some things to point out, um, these are all statistically significant. Um, so the association or correlation is um, there. And then the top one that it was correlated with, that this victim race was correlated with, was geographical region. Um, so this essentially states that southern states had higher than expected levels of crimes involving black victims. Um, similar trends were seen for duty status and official capacity. So on duty crimes, as well as crimes committed in an officer's official capacity were correlated with crimes against black victims. Um, highlighted here in this orange box is violence related. So this is the first type of crime that kind of presented itself in these bivariate associations as significant with um, black victims. So violence related crimes are associated positively with black victims, which essentially means that has a higher than expected count there. For obvious reasons, we don't want to include victim race as our dependent variable in this study. So essentially we took a closer look at those violence related crimes and kind of flipped it. And we looked at the violence related bivariate associations. Um, the first three here, profit motivated, alcohol related, and drug related, I do want to point out those are obviously other types of crime. Those are very strongly correlated with violence related um, in the sense that if a crime is categorized as any of those three, it is associated with non-violence related crimes. Um, this is true for those three, profit related, alcohol, and drug, but it's the opposite for sex related. Sex related crimes are often forcible, which we categorize as violence related. Um, I do wanna make note of the officer and victim characteristics here. One of the things that we need to do further research on is that victim ethnicity, that is another dichotomous variable for Hispanic versus non-Hispanic. Um, Hispanic victims are actually associated with nonviolent crimes. This is something that we hope to have some future research on, but we haven't had the opportunity to do so yet. Um, and then again, there is that victim race variable um, popping up as significant rela sig significantly related to violence related crimes. Next, we wanted to examine this at a multivariate level. So we wanted to see if these um, associations held true at a multivariate level. Here we used a chain decision tree model with our dependent variable being violence related criminal arrest cases. Going down the right side of the decision tree is black victims and going down the left side of the, de the decision tree is non-black victims. Um, that first split there, I wanted to point out that 80.9% of non-black victims um, we identified as violence related compared to 94.6% of crimes against black victims being um, violence related. This is statistically significant and this is one of our main conclusions of our research here. Going down that right side of the decision tree, we also have conclusions about um, a high number of cases involving black victims um, of an officer brandishing a firearm, as well as these cases are more likely to be prosecuted in federal court. Our conclusions here are still in the preliminary stages. Um, so our main conclusion here is that criminal arrest cases of law enforcement officers with black victims are more strongly associated with violence related crime compared to police crime against non-black victims. Additionally, we found over 40% of the arrest cases involve police crime against black victims where the officer, the arrested officer brandished their firearm. Um, so for our policy implications, here with the police integrity research group, our two main goals of our research group is to inform the public and improve policing. I think we've begun to scratch the surface on informing the public with this presentation today, um, but we're kind of hoping to um, collaborate on some policy implications that are potential improvements for policing. And we would love to hear any feedback that any of you guys may have here today.
If you would like um, further information, the Henry A. Wallace Police Crime Database is our public database, which presents some of our data here um, at a public platform. But thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Very well done. All right. So for our final uh, presentation in this panel, we have uh, Mark. And Mark can take the, uh, the floor if he'd like. Is Mark around? Do I see Mark? Hi, Mark. Hello. So uh, this is my presentation, part of my dissertation. And so the plan for meeting the time limit is going to be to move fairly quickly. Uh, so policing in the United States has a legitimacy problem. Uh, African Americans consistently rate police lower than any other racial categories. And we see the protests that I think we're all familiar with today. Now, it's in policing's best interest to improve its legitimacy, uh, with legitimacy being defined as the belief that the people who govern should be allowed to do so. Uh, policing has an easier time governing when people see it as legitimate and when people voluntarily comply with the law. Uh, it reduces up department resources for other uses, especially involuntary compliance. Uh, but it's not only today's policing that creates legitimacy problems. And so policing has a long history of contributing to racial stratification. Some of the earliest police, um, police departments in the United States were formed to uh, police slaves. Uh, police enforced Jim Crow laws, police uh, released attack dogs on civil rights protesters. There are numerous historical examples um, of policing in the United States being racially inequitable in that way. And so when you keep that in mind, today's policing um, you can start to see it as existing in a line, uh, a continuous line. So we want to improve policing's legitimacy. How can we do that? One very popular uh, reform approach is community policing. It has broad support that draws on the community to fight crime and it prioritizes residents' concerns about their own neighborhoods. Now, community policing doesn't always have a history of fidelity. Uh, if you were in the community policing session, uh, you heard some discussion about what does this word even mean? Uh, the, it's certainly more popular to talk about than it is to do. Uh, some departments still prescribe their priorities, even though they say they're taking a policing model. And it doesn't uh, address policing's history that I brought up explicitly. So another option would be something called apologia, uh, acknowledging and apologizing for policing's history. So an unmasking administrative evil, Balfour et al. Uh, recommend this as an approach for grievous historical misdeeds uh, that create expectations for interactions today. And so moreover than that, apologizing is a, a fairly common solution to misdeeds. Uh, but apology need not have an effect. Not all apologies are created equal. And I think we've all maybe gotten an apology that we sort of knew that they didn't mean. Apologia for racial issues in the United States has also created a lot of political pushback in a way that may have overwhelmed any benefits, um, both for people who think that um, history doesn't matter for today, so we don't have to say anything, and then people who say that uh, apology isn't enough. So governments have made this kind of apology, uh, apologia for all sorts of historical wrongdoings. Uh, some examples include Japanese internment, uh, various national colonialization projects, uh, war crimes. There are some examples in policing in Wake County, North Carolina, LaGrange, Georgia, uh, the International Union of Chiefs of Police, but no real evaluations of its effect. So the literature for Apologia's effectiveness is mixed. Um, we know community policing is difficult to do, even more difficult to do with fidelity and we know that apologia is financially cheap, even though it could invite some political costs. So I'm framing uh, apologia as a, a reform supplement. And so my hypotheses are that um, African Americans who read this sort of apo uh, apologia for policing's history will have warmer feelings, will support the police, will trust the police more than a group that does not. And so to test this hypothesis, I developed an experiment uh, it's a, a vignette experiment. It's two different groups. Each reads a different story. Uh, so in my case, 
uh, both groups read the story about how racial history, uh, the racial history of policing resembled today's policing, uh, read a story about their local department implementing community policing reform. And so the big difference is whether or not they read that apology. Uh, and so I do want to point out these are obtained sample sizes for the experiment. Uh, so not all apologies, like I said, are created equal. Um, apologia is a sort of a subcomponent of the communication discipline. I look to the communication discipline to try and construct what's called a reconciliatory uh, apology. So aiming very much, making sure that if we think the treatment is going to work, it needs to be the right kind of treatment. So I, I made sure to try to apologize. Uh, we did this survey on Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Uh, there are some problems with Amazon's Mechanical Turk, most of all um, in terms of representativeness, um, which is less of a problem because I'm examining within race, and especially in terms of data quality. There are measures to put into place to ensure data quality. Um, overall, I would say the research, my own research into Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is more and less controversial among some people, um, it's certainly no worse than most experimental samples, uh, and it certainly gives us uh, a broader geographic range than a lot of samples do. Uh, so for dependent variables, we have the feeling thermometer, a uh, very common dependent variable and validated to, um, it has convergent validity with other measurements that measure similar things. Uh, Tom Tyler's police support variable uh, respect for belief in the respect for honesty of having pride in and support for the police department. Uh, Tyler uh, validates this with actual behavior. And then so I look to Lavinge who also offered a set of um, common legitimacy questions. And so those last two uh, dependent variables, those are scales. Uh, they hang together very well. Uh, they have all the alphas and the inter item covariances are above 0.9. Uh, so because it's an experiment, uh, and as we're going to see the randomization worked out, I don't have to do very complicated math. I can just use descriptive statistics and ordinary least squares regression. So these are the balance of characteristics between treatment and control. Um, I do a subgroup analysis. I'm not going to talk about it. Nothing came back significant. Um, statistically, uh, individuals' characteristics don't predict uh, selection in the treatment or comparison group. Uh, there isn't really any incentive to select into one group or the other. What this all tells us is that the randomization of the experiment was good, which means we're able to really identify the causal effects uh, on, the, on participants' legitimacy attitudes for the treatment. So this is the feeling thermometer variable. You see the dashed line is my comparison group. The solid line is my treatment group. And so what I really want to point out about this is that the distributions look fairly similar. You may see some of the comparison group represented counterfactually. Uh, the low end comparison group may be represented in the high end treatment group. Uh, but overall, I think more similarity in the overall shape uh, than differences. And so we see this play out with the other two dependent variables. Um, we see the treatment group. The shape is more or less the same as the comparison group. Uh, maybe some counterfactual representation from the lower end to higher end. And the same thing bears out for the trusted police variable. Uh, so when we run the actual regressions themselves, what I find is that uh, the bivariate regressions came back significant for two of the three variables, none of the controlled regressions, uh, which use the balance characteristics to control the regression, uh, none of those came back significant. Um, so what does this tell us? What does this mean? Well, these results are suggestive. The bivariate coefficients were sometimes, they sometimes moved uh, the treated group on the dependent variables a little bit. Um, the covariates we lost significance, but there's good arguments in favor of the uncontrolled comparisons because of the good randomization. Uh, I fail to reject one of the null hypotheses. I reject two. Mark, other I'm sorry to interrupt. You have two minutes to go. Got it. Thank you so much. So we failed to reject one of the null hypotheses. We did reject two of the null hypotheses. Um, importantly, the uh, null that we 
did fail to reject was that Tom Tyler support variable. And since that correlates with legal behavior, it, it, it predicts legal behavior. I think that's an indicator that uh, apologia may not be appropriate to improve legal behavior. Um, like I said, the effects are overall small. And so some, even some caveats on top of small effects. Um, if apologia is not followed by actual policy reform uh, and its implementation, based on some other parts of the dissertation I did, the effects may wear off. Uh, if apologia is followed by incompatible actions, if we apologize for policing's racist history and then go on to deeply contribute to inequitable policing, the effects of apology probably wear off. Um, and then finally, like I had mentioned, apologia typically has invited costs, uh, both from people who you would maybe expect to be against apologizing for racist events, but then also um, from activists who often feel that it's not really enough to uh, address the whole history of policing, uh, which again, I pointed out, appears to them to be one continuous line. Uh, so does apology work? Yes, but it should be followed by implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, nicely done. So I don't see any questions in the chat. If any of the um, uh, attendees would like to ask a question, we do have a couple of minutes. Do any of the panelists have questions for one another? No? Okay. All righty. Okay, so that was your time, Mark. Your time had just ended. So, okay, so um, I'd like to thank all of the researchers that brought their expertise to this uh, to this conference. We are a startup conference, you know, we're the new kid on the block. And um, I really appreciate you lending your time and your energy and your expertise to this. It wouldn't have been possible without you. I also want to thank the attendees that were here as well. We have recorded all of these sessions. The sessions will be up on our YouTube page probably by the end of the year is my guess. Um, though, who knows, it's COVID and who knows what's gonna happen. So, um, you know, you'll get a notice about that as well. Um, one final thing I'd like to say is thank you again, and thank you to everybody for participating. This has been a wonderful three days. And, um, you know, here, I mean, I'm on the East Coast in the US and it's, you know, about 5 p.m. and we had, 50 people in this panel, and that's pretty freaking awesome as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, you know, the last panel at ASC, you know, you'd be lucky to get a few stragglers in there. You know, we had, yeah, we had a full boat essentially. So this so that, was, this was awesome. So that's so why we also would like to congratulate you on behalf of, you know, the attendees uh -huh. and, you know, uh, all the people uh, who presented here. I mean, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. It was a lot of work and, and I'm going, I'm taking the weekend off. I'm not even going to say the word Zoom this weekend. Uh, just kind of take a break from the internet. So I, I appreciate everybody so much for, um, for being a part of this. I hope you are uh, happy and healthy and, um, you know, enjoy the next few weeks and um, uh, take care and hope to see you in person soon. Thank you again. Take Thank care. You.